and welcome to What's Possible, Conversations with World-Class Coaches. Today, I'm excited to expose you all to my dear friend and SBC coach, Karen Warner. Karen, hello, Karen. Karen is an executive coach, and she has been doing this for two decades. That is following a two-decade career in the marketing space. Um, Her most recent position was as a VP of marketing in private equity. And Karen and I were talking right before the show, and she said, what's helpful is I've sat in the seat, I understand being on the other side of things, and I've probably made every single mistake, and I still survived after it. That's pretty powerful. And so I think Karen probably comes with a lot of empathy and understanding to to her clients. Before we jump into today's topic, I do want to share this book. It has nothing to do and maybe a little to do with what we're talking about. Karen can maybe weave it together. The reason I do want to share it, it's Karen's book, The Sudden Caregiver. I think this is so important to bring up pretty much in any conversation because all of us at one time in life are probably going to be a caregiver. So while we're not necessarily talking about caregiving today, if you are in that space where you are somebody who is caregiving for somebody um, who isn't able to care for themselves, pick up this book. It will help you tremendously. I just um, went through a situation myself and it was invaluable. So Karen, I would love to introduce you. We Today, we're going to be talking about the impact, the ripple effect. When you coach one senior leader, how does that roll out and how does that impact more? So welcome, Karen Warner. Thank you so much, Eileen. Thanks for uh, talking about my book, by the way, that, I, as you know, came at that information the hard way. And uh, and it is about building resilience and well-being for caregiving we all will be or need caregivers. So um, there's there, or else the alternative is we're not around. So we need to in, equip ourselves. Um, well, thank you. It's so great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because I, again, I think, oh, we probably won't be talking about this, but so many of the resilient skills that are in there our you know resilient skills as leaders that we need as well. So we might be we might weave that book in. We'll see how we'll see where we go. So today we will be talking about, as I mentioned, the ripple effect of when we coach one leader, what happens to the rest of their team and then the rest of the people that those leaders, um, you know, just the ripple effect all the way down and probably sideways. So Karen, before we dive totally in, I would love you to define what are we even talking about um, this impact? Well, people ask me all the time, like I've been coaching, as you said, for a couple of decades. And the one question I get asked more than any other is, do people really change? Because when you're sitting with a leader who might be a high value person, but not necessarily behaving in a way that's healthy for the team, uh, you can ask yourself, will coaching, will some intervention be helpful for this person? And I'm here to say resoundingly, people do change. And and uh, change takes work, change takes time, and it really takes courage for a leader to really, truly take on board what they might be hearing in coaching or feedback and decide which things are important for them and who they are, what to align with in order to change. But what I found that is truly amazing as I've, from the time I've coached my first team until today, is that when that leader, if I can get that leader to raise their own self-awareness, awareness of what their impact really is, the team around them gets better. They get more resilient. They get happier. Uh, And then if that happens, if they begin to thrive, the organization that that team is in begins to hit their numbers. They begin to raise their own performance. Yeah. yeah, it's that contagious effect. Once, it, yes, once people. I when you think about change, you can't change one piece of something and not expect everything around it to change. So, yeah, yeah. It, it very became, true. Yeah, wow. I would love you to share a story. I know you have um, had so many cool. Exp- well, in in two decades, many many cool experiences. If you could bubble one up to the top, 
that really shows the impact of this. I And I think what I love that you highlighted is that, yes, people can change. Because I think we so often get stuck at that's just how he is. That's just how she is. And, and that holds people where they are versus allowing someone that space to grow and show up differently. And I'd love you to share where you've seen that, how what it looked like. Thanks. I mean, it holds people where they are and it also might, separate them from their jobs. If, if the people investing in coaching, if the organization doesn't really believe someone will change, they might be sitting, they might be in their boss's mind sitting next to the door. So sometimes, and, and the example I'll, I'll share with you, the story of um, coaching a team where I got a call, we had a general manager of a very large public arena. So lots of people impacted who worked in that arena and also connect the customers, the the throngs of public coming in and out all the time. So if, again, the pebble in the pond is if you get a disgruntled uh, coffee server in the cafe, you're going to not necessarily have a happy client or customer. Um, So I got called in and I said, I, I talked to the people, the HR people who were thinking of investing in coaching for this general manager. And I said, let me go, let me go there. Let me go on site and talk to the manager, meet with, in this case, a man, you know, face to face in his office. But I also want to meet his team. I want to meet the people that are impacted by this person. And for me at that time, I was just trying to gather information. So he had 17 people, some direct reports and some that reported into him. And I was put in a room with these 17 people and they were very unhappy. And they pretty much said within uh, the 10 minutes of me trying to build some trust with them. And I was doing a workshop so that we were just interacting, not in an artificial way or in it was psychological safety. And they said, we think you're here to fire this general manager. We, we hope that's why you're here. And for me, philosophically, that is not what I do. No. So I said, yeah, so my job is to get you sitting in this room to join me and maybe join this general manager if it if it if he's good for it so that we raise the health of the organization but it's not you against him or him against you even though i get it that's how it feels in this room at this time so when i went to meet with the general manager he literally had in his office to a gift that had been given to him from his previous company when he took this job and it was a a a wine bottle that said Jekyll and a wine bottle that said Hyde. So that tells you right away that this guy has taken a legacy with him of erratic behavior, unpredictable and inconsistent. And that's how he was being experienced by these 17 people that who also ran, you know, there were probably 5,000 people all total in that or whole organization. So my job was to work with that general manager to, to help him understand the feedback, to help him, um, we did all the things coaches do. Here are models. Here's a way to think about it. I literally had him carry uh, a stone in his pocket. So whenever he felt like he was going to explode, he would feel that stone and take a pause. So we did things like that. But what started to happen over the nine months that we were all together, because I would go and meet with them, meet with everyone once a month is that the team started relaxing. They started trusting. They started feeling, they started taking risks with this general manager. And when he didn't explode because he was being coached, it started making everyone work better together. So it improved the communication. It improved the efficacy of the the people on the team. They felt they had permission to go to him and say, hey, you're doing it. Um, And then that, and that's really what, we're trying to do here and what what we're talking about. If we can coach that leader up, does that leader then improve the impact and the health of the team that they're at the center of? Yeah, wow. And taking it one step further, what was the result of that then? Once once the things shifted, what how did that impact? Well, when I got there, they had high retention rate. People would go in and out. There was a high churn. Someone might stay six months ago. This is toxic. It's not for me. Uh, but at this point, the general manager is still there. And the many of those 17 people that were in the room on that day are still there. And that was about eight years ago. So, wow. um, 
Yeah. Now I will say, I'm the first person to say, I don't have a magic wand. I'm no one's getting a lobotomy. Coaching is I'm, <laughs> I'm coaching humans and they can be inconsistent, but I do think enough of a meeting of the minds took place that people relaxed and they felt like they could come forward with the issues they had. And when he uh, got upset or expressed upsetness, they can say, hey, hold on, wait. Like they had that permission, which they had not had before. Yeah. And I think you might have said um, they had high retention. You meant they had low retention? I'm sorry. Yes. They, they retained. (laughs) Okay, good. Okay. I want to make sure before in case the listeners are thinking, wait a second. So high retention, isn't that so low high retention, right? They retained. Well, they retained after you were there. But yes. before it seemed like retention. Was oh, I said, I'm sorry if I misspoke. Yeah, they no, had, I think that's yeah. okay. But now we're clear. So before yeah. before the coaching, retention was low where they were going in and out. And Correct. then retention was higher once once you worked with this leader. Exactly. They're still, okay. they're still there. I'm friends with them on Facebook and they're oh, still there. Yeah. That's so great. And if you think about it in a large company in particular, that just, it seeps through the entire organization. And that, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And there, and that there's a financial, right? We, that's a company that needed to retain that business. And if they had a revolving door of employees, it, it was very unsteady. It was very unpredictable. So getting that steady state was a, we really felt like in the, and the human resources, people who brought me in said, this guy has turned a corner. So wow. I, I, wow. Yeah. And you think about also just the cost savings to the company when when you do that. Yes, that's a really good measure of the pebble in the pond because I work with organizations where we might have a CEO who loses, he has a temper tantrum. This literally happens. CEO has a temper tantrum at a, a company event. Someone who works 20 miles away in the field calls me and tells me this happened within seconds of, within minutes of the CEO having that temper tantrum. So we have to be aware that there's a contagion in leadership that goes along with our behavior. And there's actually research on this. So there's a piece of research that says that We, my mood as a leader ripples out into the organization, only takes seven minutes to contaminate or, or make better the organization. And then there's another piece of research that says each of us as leaders at the center of our node, at the center of our, think of concentric circles, I'm at the center and there are 12 people associated with me. 12 people are impacted by what I do and what I think and how I behave on a daily basis. Each of those 12 people has 12 people. And there's another piece of research that says, if you're in the center of a node in networking, you impact people three degrees of separation out. So I've done that math and that's over 1700 people. And we can allow for like maybe 12 people associated with me or overlapping with 12 people associated with you. So, But even if it was half that, that's still my seven minute temper tantrum is going out to 860 some people. So if that's the case, then wouldn't it be a good thing for us to manage our self deter, you know, our self-awareness, manage what we say, how we want to say it, not indulge in, I'm a leader, I can do whatever I want in some of those behaviors. And often leaders don't know, I, I call it the dinosaur, the long tail, like they don't know when they turn around in a room that their their mood is taking out everyone behind them. Uh, and so that's where coaching comes in because it really does put a mirror up and say, here's some feedback. You might want to take this on board. And then we can intervene upon some of those behaviors, depending on what they choose to do. Yeah. Well, it is. It's it's such a strong case for coaching. And obviously that's what we do with Silicon Valley Change Executive Coaching. And um at the same time, it it makes sense. And I've I found uh, several of our clients right now are doubling down on coaching with their most senior leadership because of the times that we're in right now. Right. And to invest in that 
particularly the people that you want to keep there and to navigate during these really tough times to have leaders that have the skills to motivate and elevate those around them versus have, you know, a temper tantrum and have it spin out to everybody. Yeah. And you mentioned the cost of that temper tantrum because that is what I observe because I get the calls. Like no one did anything that day except talk to each other about that behavior. And it's now part of the narrative of what it's like to work in that culture. So it, it, it if you say, uh, if you say that if I don't have the numbers to say that's costing the company money, but I don't think it's a leap to think that it might be. Whereas when I work with leaders who are, how can I serve the people working for me? How can I develop them? How can I invest in them? What do they need? What ends up happening is a fast car and an open road. Like there's no sandbagging. There's no slowing down. There aren't people looking over their shoulder and saying, should I or should I say this? It's a really different experience culturally in those organizations. Yeah, well, and we talk so much about psychological safety and the importance of having that so that you feel like from the leadership on down, there is that safe space to be able to... um, say what you're going to say, not have someone lash out at you, or I love the dragon tail that's whipping around because it is, it does, um, it takes down everyone and there's a lack of awareness there. Yes. Yeah. I'm curious what your thoughts are. I was talking to one of my HR partners the other day about a very senior leader who the organization wants to keep. Um, it's super important to the organization yet. Um, they're not, there's some people below um, who report into that person and there's feedback that um, the relationship's not as healthy as they would like. They have a hard time with this leader. And so we talked about a 360 doing as, um, as you know, uh, both of us being trained on shift positive, big believer in shift positive 360. Um, but What are your thoughts on that in terms of, even if you're not doing a 360, how to help organizations um, and groups give feedback to a leader? Because I heard you kind of talk about that a little bit in your story that you shared, but do you have any other examples of how teams have been able to share feedback with a leader who might be more resistant to feedback. And it goes back to you coaching the leader on how to receive it, I'm sure. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. Well, I think that's a really good question. I don't think you have to wait to hire a coach to get 360 feedback or at least feedback on a regular basis. I do a, an assessment when I go in to work with clients. It's an electronic 360. And one of the questions is, they get rated on is, do do I ask for feedback on a regular basis about the the impact of me on the organization? And in one organization I work in, that's question 16, and it's always in the bottom five. And that's not unusual because organizations don't emphasize when you're a manager or a leader, they don't say, hey, you know what? I'm going to grade you. I'm going to score your performance management on how much feedback you seek. In fact, we almost never ask for feedback. So there are formal ways of getting feedback, as you know, and we do them, but there are also informal ways. There are ways, first of all, to know you've gotten formal feedback in the past, whether you're going to get it tomorrow or in the next six months. And pretty much when you're at a certain level, you've heard that feedback over and over again. So ask yourself, have I addressed that? Like, what's the knock on me? What's the story about me? And have I ever taken something on to address it? Another way to do it is I I think sometimes leaders naively believe that the team will come forward and say, you know, uh, whenever I'm talking to you, your cell phone is in front of your face and I think you're not listening to me. And I worked with a leader, that was literally the case. And he said, and he was totally unaware that that was his habit. And he said, well, why don't they tell me? And I'm in a room with them saying, you're not going to tell him who said this because they don't want people to, they didn't want to be outed for that piece of feedback. So it is helpful if the leader opens themselves up to feedback every once in a while to say, you know, is there something that I'm doing that bothers you in an informal way or walk out of a meeting and look over your shoulder and say, how was that? 
did I, did I, that make sense to you? Does that help you or hurt you in doing what you're doing? Yeah. I really like that. And you almost think of if organizations start to have cultures where there's senior leadership, that's part of it. You know, we talk a lot about having stay conversations and um, regular, you know, professional development conversations. Don't wait till the performance review. We talk all about that, but it's really about the um, person being managed. However, if we also integrate into those one-to-ones a, a time, you know, if a cult, the cult, Company culture is such that let's um, ask for feedback when you're in those one-to-ones. And even something as simple as that question that we often ask on our 360 is, if I were being more effective, what would that look like? You know, yes. can you can you help me out? When when do you feel like I work best with you and how can we do more of that? So it, it allows that leader to say it in such a way that it welcomes that conversation. Exactly. One exercise that I've done lately is uh, when there's a new leader and they are, they, I do a new leader acceleration. So I get the direct reports of this leader in a room that this leader will talk to, tell their people, you know, tell Karen, whatever you need to tell and leaves the room. And then we flip chart all of the things that could possibly um, it's like, what do you want to know about this person? But when this person is at their best, what are they doing? What are ways that you would support them? What do you appreciate? So it's positive, but it's also getting at what should this person stop or start doing? Sure. And I feel like, and after that, one of the things I've started doing at the request of the leaders, the new leaders is in six months follow up. So that they're actually saying, I committed to all this stuff in that room with Karen six months ago. Karen, go back in and ask, am I, am I on track? And it, the, it's a form of feedback that is, it takes a little bit of time, but it's not that formal 360. It's just me having conversations with the people that were in that room. How's he doing? What would you, what would, what could he do more of when the team, when the team is at the, their best, how is this person supporting that, getting you there? Um, so that's another way of getting that kind of feedback. Yeah, I really like how this conversation, I hope people take away that, yes, if you bring a coach in to work with, you know, a senior leader, the impact and the ripple effect will be significant across the organization. If you are a smaller organization and you feel like you're not able to bring in an executive coach at this time, there are still ways that you can help that senior leader have that same ripple effect. Um, and it all boils down to being open to feedback, to soliciting feedback, not even just being open to it, but asking for it. Because oftentimes we'll say, oh, I'm fine if people give me feedback. Well, people still feel anxious about doing that. So if you proactively say, hey, can you, I want to make sure that I'm meeting your needs. I want to make sure that the way we're working together is what you need from me or um, how to be more effective. You can still do that without a coach. And if you're able to bring in a coach, it's an outstanding way because the coach can both work with your leader directly as well as the team. And you'll start to see that, that effect across the organization. So excellent. All right, um, Karen, let's move on because our time is almost up. And I say this at every webinar, I'm like, oh, I want to have, a, we have to have another part too. So I am going to ask you to play one, two, three with me. Are you up for it? Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. What is one mindset shift that you hope that our leaders take away today? Well, we happen to have just talked about, I think, the biggest mindset shift, which is, I think there's Bill Gates said, everyone needs a coach. Doesn't matter what you do, what, you're, what field you're in. It's the only way we can improve. And so feedback, having a feedback mindset, if you're an organization, having a feedback culture, having exposing your organization and your leaders to, to areas where they can get that feedback, where it's a natural, easy, not punishing part of the culture. And so the mindset shift is instead, we, we always say, and it, it's a cliche, feedback is a gift, but it actually is. So the thing to do when you hear feedback and I, I get feedback all the time. I'm in that business. And the first thing I want to do is say, no, that, no, you don't understand. No. The first thing you do when you hear feedback is think, thank you. Thank you for 
being open and giving me this piece of information I wasn't seeing or I might be blind to. Think, then think, how might this be true? If it is true, what can I do about it? How can I take it on board? So the mindset shift is seek the feedback in all these forms we've talked about and then say thank you because it is a gift and think about you don't have to take you don't have to change everything that is given to as feedback but if it, if someone has had the courage to give it to you there might be something in it that you can take away oh i love that think then think because we often get the yeah buts yeah if someone gives you feedback and you say yeah but i didn't mean that yeah but so think and think yeah oh. i literally have that stuck in my head when someone starts giving me feedback thank thank you i might Take that first breath of no, no, but then I'll go, yeah, thank you. And then let me, let me think about it. And also you don't have to change it on on the spot or commit to anything. Let me think about it and see what I can do. Wow. Yeah. And I really like, I didn't, I hadn't heard Bill Gates say that about coaching. However, it is interesting now, you know, being in this business, both you and I have been in this business for years and years and years and years. And we've seen the landscape and the acceptance of coaching and the invitation to coaching just change dramatically over these last many, many years. And it has become, I'd say, more of a norm. And for the particularly those senior levels, even though our organization does a lot at the, um, we also have programs where we're working at the um, manager through SVC, SV, SVC, SVP levels. And then of course the senior leadership as organizations are saying, wow, it works so well here. We also want to bring it to this level here. But I do see where when you see successful leaders, chances are ask them if they have a coach and chances are they do have a coach. So yeah. it it has become something that People see the value. And to your point, for our organization, I know that different organizations um, handle it differently. Ours is only for leaders who we want to invest in. It is not for people who are showing them the door out. That's not yeah. that's not what we do. Thank goodness. Um, we yeah. get to do the fun stuff. So, all right. What are two ideas or facts that you would like our listener to take away? Well, the first fact is that seven minutes. Consider you may not be aware of your impact. But consider before you act, am I going to uh, explode? Am I going to make this situation worse? Or is there a way I can make it better? I call that the power of the pause. Take a moment because whatever you do in that reactive moment has that seven minute ripple effect. And again, with social media, texting and video, it's out there. It, I mean, I've seen, I've had leaders have things put on TikTok. So just know (laughs) that seven minutes goes really, it goes really fast and it goes really far. Um, The second thing is if you, if you are a leader, think about leaders who you have worked for or have come in contact with, they might be in your organization, who you consider great leaders. And hopefully in across the course of your career, you have at least one person who is that person who seems to you to embody not a perfect human being, but uh, what does this leader do that they do really well? And how have they succeeded? Usually they really understand and develop and pay attention to the people who work for them in their organization. And when you can come up with who that is, One thing I would say is write down the characteristics and traits of that person, because that's really where you can aspire to make some changes without getting hit over the head with feedback. Mm. Yeah. Look for someone doing it well, find that model. And then I love the power of the pause. I've been had several conversations actually this week about that exact topic. And somebody was saying that one of their leaders always stays on mute in a meeting. And this is obviously if you're working virtually, um, always stays on mute because the time it takes to unmute gives you even just a few seconds to pause. Oh, and I like I, that. Yeah. It makes you think twice as you go to unmute, then you're like, hmm, do I need to say this? Do I want to react this way? How do I want to react? Yeah. 
Oh, were you going to say something else? Well, I was going to say all those cliches we tell ourselves about count to 10, take a walk around the block. Those actually work. Those are, there's research on those. So it's always better to add value, add a little light rather than darkness into whatever the situation is that is, that is, um, that needs to be addressed. Even as you were talking, it made me think, even if you just ask yourself this one question, is this my emotional brain that's about to talk or is it my thinking brain, the prefrontal yeah. cortex? Yes, that's good. That alone like, might stop you enough to say, it's the emotional brain. Let me, let me dial this back. Yeah. So, all right. What are three actions that people can plug and play right now? Well, the first I would say is if you're a leader, find a way to get that feedback. And there, there's no, and I know we keep using that term, but there's no substitute for it. One thing that I encourage leaders to do is sit down one-on-one with their people and ask simple questions like, do you have what needs to do? You have what, do you have what you need to do your job? Is there any way that I can support you? Is that, you know, something you just said, like, how can I make this better for you? What can I do for you? We don't have those conversations because we go so rapidly through our days and, and our events kind of catching and, and moving things along. So it is good in your one-on-ones to ask that question. People really appreciate being asked because often one-on-ones are like, okay, what do you got? Okay, we're done our agenda, let's go. But give that a little bit of time and thought. Yeah, I like that. Um, The second thing is for organizations, which is intervene. So if you have high value people who you feel could benefit from shifting behaviors. And to be clear, we don't have to be dealing with toxic leaders or not toxic leaders. There are people, myself included, who always need improvement, right? There's always ways to get better at the things we do. And we we at Silicon Valley, we work with high potential leaders. They usually are not broken. They are usually great and going for great and even greater. So for that reason, it's okay as an organization to intervene on really great people and say, you're on the path that is going to get you to a good place. And with coaching, we can get you to an even better place. So, And the coaching can be internal, by the way. It doesn't have to be external coaches like Silicon Valley Change, although I happen to think it's better when you have an external coach who can come in and say things that internal coaches may not be able to say. And there's also a safety. That's one of the things that we find when the org- our, the organizations bring us in. It's the leaders need that complete safe space. Even if an internal says it's confidential, it's, you know, all this, there still is that level of concern sometimes for a leader that just to be completely with somebody outside gives a sense of um, comfort. So yes. it, it really yes. does. Confidence yeah. and, and confidential, yes. <clears throat> um, and I guess the third thing would be if you work for a leader where it's not going well and they need to understand the impact, their impact on you, it is not just the leaders. Uh, we're not just sitting around waiting for the leader to change. Try to find ways in the organization. All organizations have avenues where you can maybe get the message to that leader and to invest in that leader being at their best instead of how is this leader, uh, you know, impacting me in a negative way. Just it's like those 17 people in the room going, well, we hope we hope you're here to fire this guy. No, we we are here to work together to make sure this person understands what they need to do, start doing, stop doing in order to provide the leadership that this team needs. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. And it makes me think again of the shift positive 360, where we're looking at stakeholders and and making, turning them into allies, ideally. And so how can you look at yourself as an ally to this leader? And um, I love how you did those three actions because you took it from every lens, the leader's lens, the organization's lens, and the direct report or somebody in that person's world. So thank you. That was really beautifully done. So I appreciate it. Well, 
But when I had three, I thought of the three stakeholder groups, right? Because everyone has an active role that they can play. There's always, in terms of accountability, always one more thing you can do. Just ask that question, what more could I do to to make sure that all these stakeholder groups are getting what they need from me? And, And asking ourselves, what's my role in this? Regardless of which position you're in, what is my role? Yes. Because we often want it to be your role. Karen, yes. can you fix yourself? Okay, well, how? What, what can I do to help Karen be the best version of herself? Exactly. Well, when we talk about that conflict resolution, one of the things we talk about is that person is that person. They've been this way for a long time. But, I mean, this goes back to organizations intervening. Sometimes the leaders that we get to coach have never been coached. No one has ever given them the gift of sitting down and going, you know, when you do this, it costs a day in everybody's lives and in your companies. So, and often they haven't had it. So it's not, uh, it's a, it's a gift and it's also a way to unjam some of the things that slow down production and slow down performance. All right. Your final, final sentence. And the question is, what's possible when a leader is coached? When a leader is coached, I feel everything is possible, but all boats rise on the tide. So when you get a leader who understands their impact and when that in, they can influence their own impact to be good, healthy, productive, the team feels that. And we'll follow that leader, even if it doesn't make any sense, because that leader is showing they care, they develop, and they create an environment where people are happy to come and work. Mm. Don't we all want that? Thank you, Karen, so much. Karen Warner, I love being with you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Eileen.